welcome everyone. My name is Adie Filson and I am the mobility education coordinator with the city of Cambridge in the community development department. Um, and uh, Mass Bike is joining us today to talk a little bit about bike touring and long distance riding and kind of like what you need to get started as well as to answer any questions that you may have about gear, routing, um, anything along those lines. So with that, I'll hand it over to Galen. All right, thanks, Adie. I wonder if I'll do a little screen share if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so I have a quick mock-up of a presentation, but it's definitely not gonna be everything. This is a, a loose presentation, but I definitely wanna kind of remark on stories and if you are out there and if you've got anything to share, please do share it. Um, so I am with Mass Bike, we're the statewide bicycling advocacy organization, which means we do cover the entirety of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And there are some great bike camping and long distance riding routes in the Commonwealth, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about a little of the how to's in terms of gear, in terms of biking, in terms of nutrition, and a little bit more of just to encourage you to get out and ride. So um, a little bit about me, um, I've been Gosh, I've been bikepacking, I think, at least once or twice a year for the past five or six years, which means I've amassed a good amount of gear. And uh, the photo that you're seeing right here is actually from last year um, with myself, obviously, I'm the one on the right, and Christine Keeney from the East Coast Greenway Alliance is the one on the left. And this is from our ride last year, which was a five-day ride from Providence, Rhode Island, up to Provincetown, Massachusetts, and we were actually routing the East Coast Greenway. I'll talk a little bit about the East Coast Greenway in a little bit, but it's um, a 3,000 plus mile route, which basically takes you from the top of Maine, Calais, Maine at the Canadian border, all the way down the East Coast and ends in Key West. That's just one of the many routes that are out there, which are, um, you know, you could go for months, you can go for weeks, you can go for days, or you could just go for hours. But the cool thing about bike packing is once you have the gear, you can pretty much be self-sufficient. And the beauty of being out on a bike is if you have a little bit of know-how, and um, you're okay with a little bit of adventure, you can just go. And the cool thing about being on a bike is you get to explore. So this trip with Christine that I took last year was actually to route the East Coast Greenway, which meant that we got to find little nooks and crannies around, um, which we can turn into a map, which you can actually download and ride. So that's a little bit of a taste of what we're going for. Um, I really like this photo. This is taken at New Bedford, the bottom part of the South Coast. You can see my fully packed bike at the front and Christine's as well. I'll go into a little bit about what gear that I did bring. Um, but you don't need to go this far. If you want to go something as light, um, there's different forms of bike packing, all the way to the self-sufficient. You're carrying your own water, you're carrying your own tent and your sleeping pads and your own food, all the way to as light as just you and a bike, some clothes and a credit card and a cell phone and what we call credit card camping. So don't be intimidated by some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today, but I do want to encourage us to share some stories. So just to populate a little bit of the Q&A, so feel free to just throw a little bit down, even if it's just a story and not a question, I do wanna hear about it. I'm also gonna lean a little bit on AD, who is our host today, because AD, um, I don't know if she is gonna talk a little bit about it or not, but she did a cross country ride solo uh, a little more than two years ago, I think it was, right? Yeah, um, yes it was, it was just yeah. about years um, ago. Started on the East Coast and ended up in um, Oregon and meandered her way down, way across, way up and across. So um, you can do this supported, unsupported, but the idea of this presentation is to inspire you to get out. And the cool thing about getting out now is that it's really easy to physically distance and to be kind of out of COVID society and get out in the world without feeling cooped up. So we have had too many Zoom calls, we've had too much working from home, too many classrooms over the computer. The beauty of getting out and bike camping is it's you in the real world. And yes, the real world still exists, so feel encouraged to go out and ride. All right, well with that preamble, let's jump right in. So, what do you really need to get going? Got a couple of examples, and by no means is this a necessities list or an exhaustive list, but this is just a, uh, a flavor of what's going on. So here is what we would call a lightly packed adventure bike. Um, 
This is arguably uh, male geometry, so um, don't want to pigeonhole anybody, but the first thing you're really going to have to worry about when you get going is getting yourself an adventure bike. Now, it doesn't have to be as beefy and as packed as this. This is just an example. But this is a Trek adventure bike, and you can see that it's got front racks, rear racks, it's got multiple water bottle cages, and it's got enough, um, I guess, bags that you can tote around uh, your clothes, your food, your tent, your water. So things you're gonna have to worry about, of course, are clothing for multiple weather scenarios. And today's a great example of New England weather. I don't know if any of you got caught in that rainstorm, I hope not, but today went from blazingly hot to now refreshingly cool thanks to a nice, um, pretty robust thunderstorm. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you are prepared and you've got enough gear to carry it. Um, cool thing about an adventure bike is it's got enough, we call them mounts or eyelets or screw holes so that you can actually put racks on to carry your gear. Um, this bike does have multiple bottle holders. You can see that there is even a spot for a water bottle cage underneath the down tube. Um, water is gonna be an essential when you're out there in the wild. Um, but then it's also got enough holds so that if you have your waterproof bags, you can kind of find creative ways of stashing your stuff. I do recommend getting a front and a rear rack so that you can disperse the weight a little bit evenly. I'll go back to my first picture. You can see that I'm a little more loaded in the rear and it's a kind of an overloaded one. I'm carrying a full tent, full panniers in the back, um, but then in the front, I've got my sleeping pack and I have a frame pack in the middle. Um, so what I'm gonna wanna encourage you to do is find a bike that has capacity and capabilities of carrying multiple areas so that you can understand how your bike balances, how your bike turns, how it handles, how it steers, how it accelerates when you have the weight towards the rear, weight towards the front, or weight towards the middle. I don't wanna prescribe one way versus another for you. This is gonna be something that you should explore for yourself, but I'm going to encourage you to get a bike that has multiple options so that you don't feel stuck in one position or stuck with one gear setup. If you don't have a bike that you wanna totally fit out, and I'll keep in mind that this is kind of a road style bike with wider tires um, so that it can handle a little bit more off-road terrain, um, you can also get a bike that just has a little trailer with it. So a normal old mountain bike, a normal old road bike, you don't even need to modify it, but this is what's called a Bob trailer attachment. Um, and you can see that this rider pretty much has a full-on camping setup but the idea of carrying on your bike or carrying on a trailer means that you're not carrying the weight on your back. If you have a backpack, if you have a camping pack, if you're carrying a lot of the, the food, the water weight on your body, you're gonna get fatigued and uh, it's not gonna be a fun time. So I do encourage you to find some sort of capacity that you're carrying it on your machinery and not on your body. Cool part about a Bob trailer is that it's just a modifiable attachment to pretty much any old bike. It goes through the skewer um, on a quick release. So this is just a regular old mountain bike that has the attachment to it. And you can see that um, what's really keen about this setup is that there's a big pack that's waterproof and that's gonna be absolutely essential. So say you were out riding today and you get caught in a rainstorm, that's probably totally fine as long as your inner gear does not get wet. Your bike is gonna get wet, your outer bags are gonna get wet, your body's gonna get wet, but you gotta make sure your clothes stay dry your food stays dry, and if you're camping, you gotta make sure that any sort of fire equipment or any cooking equipment does not get wet as well. But two different options, carry it in the trailer, carry it on the bike. But again, my recommendation is not to be able to carry it on your body. Um, I'll take a quick pause to see if there are any questions, but I'll also ask if anybody out there is a hiker or a camper, you're kind of 90% of the way there. All the gear that you would use for camping out in the woods, if you were gonna do a weekend in the whites or go up to the Green Mountains in Vermont or even out in Greylock out in Western Mass, or maybe you're camping on the beach, you're gonna want a tent, you're gonna want a, a sleeping pad, and there's a variety of options that are out there. So my best friend when I'm bikepacking actually is to swing on over to REI or some other camping store and just kind of stocking up on similar stuff that you would have if you were gonna do a couple days out on foot. That translates really well if you're going out by bike. Cool. Um, here's a fully um, operable campsite. The cool thing about this is that this is a very low profile tent. 
doesn't even have a base floor. It's really just a rain fly and a pole. You could even replace that pole with a stick if you want to go lighter weight. You can not even use uh, the weight that you're carrying on your bike. You could find a stick that pops up. Um, this is not my photo, but this is very similar to how I did about two weeks in the Shenandoah, where I had a sleeping pad, um, a sleeping bag, a waterproof rain fly, and it was all very, very lightweight. Um, if you find yourself out in the woods, some people do like to camp in the woods, just make sure you're at kind of a uh, legit campsite so that you know, you're not doing anything too back country and that you might have potable water nearby, but you don't need to go full on gear. This is a really nifty way of camping, of just making it so that you're, you stay waterproof and so that you've got a nice little protective shell. It's also nice to have a little bit of a home base uh, what I've found when I've been out biking and you spend, you know, six, eight, or even 10 hours on a bike is that you feel very much out in the open. It's not quite vulnerable, but it does kind of make you a little bit wary if you're just way out in the wild and that if you are able to pull over at the end of a long day and find a nice little home, make a little home base for yourself, really kind of helps center yourself and kind of bring you back to um, basically a home base. So carry something that you can kind of make a little localized spot. Um, you're going to find a variety of ways of tents, of pads, of, you know, ways of doing overnights. So again, I don't want to prescribe for you just to throw little options that are out there, but um, go as lightweight as possible. And I will say that weight is a consideration. You're going to be adding weight as you go in terms of water weight, in terms of food, in terms of other things that you're going to pick up. You might even want to shed some stuff. So starting off lightweight is actually a really nifty way to go. Now let me see, I can't see if I can access the Q&A, so I'll ask Adi to be the host if there are any questions for me. Sure, Gideon is asking, um, I've camped under tarps rather than fully enclosed tents in Colorado before where there wasn't much in the way of bugs. You didn't find this pole slash floorless setup to be too buggy? Ooh, good question. The bugginess is a consideration if that is a concern for you. Um, always, of course, if you're going to be out in the woods, you should have some bug spray. Um, and it really depends on where you are. So we'll talk a little bit about the East Coast Greenway or some other U.S. bicycling routes in a minute. But the idea of where you are geographically is going to change how buggy it is. So, for instance, just this past weekend, I did a big old bike packing trip. I went out for four days. On day one, or really on night one, I found myself next to kind of a beaver pond, which was, I was hoping going to be swimmable running water, but it turned out to be more of a bog, thanks to the beavers. So it turned out to be incredibly mosquito infested. There's not really much you can do. Um, we did light a fire. Um, smoke does do a good amount to keep bugs away, especially if you got like dry leaves around. You can basically have a small fire that you just kind of keep packing full of leaves to create a lot of smoke. Um, and then one thing I'll grab, which is really nifty, to handle the bug spray is Tiger Balm. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Tiger Balm, but if you do get the bug bites, it's gonna be inevitable, especially if you're doing a bike trip in July. Um, Tiger Balm is gonna be one of your best friends. And this is the um, spicy version. There's also a cool version. Um, but basically just find some sort of ointment or something so the bug bites don't bother you. Um, if you're in Colorado, especially if you're above the tree line, great. There's probably not going to be a lot of bugs. Um, if you're in central mass and you're camping by the Quabbin Reservoir and there's a lot of stagnant water around, you are going to get bugs. <sighs> it is inevitable. So one tip for kind of avoiding some of the bugginess is end your day so that you can set up and kind of make a little home base well before sundown. If you can give yourself about 90 minutes or two hours before sundown, you're gonna do wonders for getting away and out of the mosquito time. But there is basically an hour before sunset to an hour to an hour and a half after, which is prime mosquito hour. It is just the case. Um, I don't have better suggestions besides it's a mental game. And once you get the bug bite, just don't scratch it. It becomes a mantra, don't scratch, don't scratch, don't scratch. Um, I don't know, AD, do you have any other suggestions of avoiding bug bites out there? Um, I think that it, it, it really just depends. So just, you know, it depends on the night. If there's a bit of wind, um, you know, you can do without 
uh, bug nets or any sort of like, or anything like that. I camp with a hammock setup and a, and I have a little bug net that goes around my hammock setup. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been nights where, and I have friends that have camped with um, uh, bivy sacks as well. And there are nights when, you know, the, it's not even the bites that are keeping you up. It's the sound of the bug of the mis the mosquitoes are so bad that they're just buzzing in your ears. And I mean, I think the thing about bike camping, especially on many day, many multi day trips, is that sometimes you're just going to have bad nights. Um, and it's kind of kind of luck of the draw. Um, and um, I think just being prepared for that. Um, is is worthwhile but yeah something where you don't have an actual a setup where you don't have an actual bug net you are more at risk for that um i think some people are willing to play it a little bit more risky than others um i think definitely west coast i've seen a lot more people camp without any sort of bug setup i personally probably wouldn't um in these parts but um elsewhere i mean i think what Galen was talking about um, with a lot of the gear being quite similar to what you would need for, for backpacking or sort of like backcountry camping is very true. The great thing is about bike camping though is that you do have a little more flexibility in terms of um, you know, mailing gear home um, and also having people mail gear to you or like buying stuff online and having it mailed to you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a lot more flexibility there in terms of you'll probably not just be in really remote areas for long, long stretches of time, unless you plan a really remote bike packing trip. That is true. That's actually some really good considerations I should have mentioned is that a lot of it is about the route. We'll talk about route in a minute. Um, if you're doing a bike like this, um, this could be off-road, but typically you're going to do mileage on pavement. And if there's roads, there's probably civilization nearby or infrastructure nearby. So you might not even need to bring everything. So know where the towns are, know where the resupply stops are. But if you are going to go and say do um, some real mountain biking off-roads, for instance, the Bay Circuit Trail is a really awesome trail around Massachusetts, kind of like, um, and I'll get to a, a website up in, in a minute, but there's a lot of off-roading that you need a mountain bike for which really do take you out in the woods. So um, it really is kind of geographically based. Um, two points and me, I'm, what I'm doing off screen is kind of routing through my bags and stuff to, to use as examples as they come up. Um, this is a bivy sack and this is something that's really um, small and lightweight. And if I was in a really temperate climate, um, July in Massachusetts, for instance, I'm not really worried about hypothermia, for instance, might get chilly. But um, I could, you know, have a bivy sack, which is kind of just like a little protective, almost like a small shell that you can cover yourself in overnight. Um, you can do hammocks. I know, AD, you did mostly hammock when you were doing your bike pack. So this is my little, like, camping hammock, which packs down, and I could just put in between two, two uh, trees. Granted, that means I have to be biking somewhere where there's a forest. So, again, there's some considerations if I was going to be biking along the coast. Um, beachfront, I might not really enjoy a hammock because there might not be trees to swing it up to. Um, and then another thing to show, this is a uh, small little mosquito head net. So if I really was out, and I bought this last year for my East Coast Greenway trip because we were along the South Coast. And one consideration with mosquitoes is that triple E is a threat in Massachusetts, um, which is a mosquito-borne virus, which is very serious. Um, it's treatable, but it's very serious and very prevalent around here. So we were actually in triple E danger last year. So I went ahead and got a little bit more mosquito protection for that trip. I never used it though. But you can see it's very small and very lightweight. And I could just put it in my pack very simply. Um, and this would go around kind of my head helmet area. if I was in a very buggy area. And then I would a, be having long sleeves and pants. So even if it was hot, I'd have a lightweight long sleeve and a lightweight long pants to keep the mosquitoes out too. So various different tips and tricks. Um, and again, it really depends on your own sensitivity. Um, one of the key things I will recommend though, again, is Tiger Balm. Like this stuff is gold um, to keep your sanity um, from, from getting buggy out there. So it really is, is kind of a personal preference. So I hope that did help. Um, I can 
dig through some other gear. So if you have any more questions about any particularities about camping, um, I'll see if I have the gear to match it while I'm here. Cool. I'll keep flying through. Um, we talked a bit about routing, so know your route. So these are also two other images that we had last year. So we were again rerouting the East Coast Greenway, which is a great, supposed to be an off-road trail. So you can see the left picture. That's actually the Bourne Canal that splits right along the Cape. And it's lovely. It's paved. It's flat. It's really enjoyable. Um, there's no uh, vehicular traffic. It is just the straight and flat. Um, but if you're going off the maps, you should know that sometimes the maps fail you and you might end up in something like the right which was about a mile and a half of sand that we had to trudge through. Now, as an advocacy organization, Mass Bike is doing our darndest to make these pathways connect so that we do have a contiguous network, but we're a couple decades away from actually having a fully cross state or even cross country north and south routing. Um, so know the route a little bit ahead of time and just be ready for a contingency plan. Now, Christine and I decided to actually trudge through because we're like, darn it, we want to see what this path is going to be. Um, they are going to pave this. This is actually on the project list for this year. So the pathway that we were on last year will continue on the way through. But because we were doing it in 2019 and not 2021, we had to deal with a little bit of sand. So know your route is also a really handy tip to have. Um, also know your topography. So I tried to pull a map of some of the, the topographical routing of Massachusetts to get you to know it, but um, you should know that most of our mountains in New England go north to south. So if you're going to do an east-west trip, you're going to be going up and over a couple of mountain ranges. Um, you can pick your roads or your off-roads or your pathways based off how much actually climbing you want to do. And I would recommend that it's not about the mileage when you're doing your route, more so it's about the cumulative gain that you're gonna be climbing in meters or in feet. So you could do a 80 mile day and you could only climb, I don't know, 600 feet, 800 feet, and you'll feel amazing. You could do a 25 mile day and you could end up climbing 4,000 feet and your legs will be very tired. Um, know your routes and a lot of that does come down to topography as well. Um, I also did a route a couple of years ago where I did the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is in Virginia. It's on the eastern, I mean, the western mountains of Virginia. It's amazing. It is a national park, the whole 3,300 plus miles. Um, if I was going to do the whole route, I would have ended up climbing, I think, something around 13 or 14,000 feet, which would have been a lot. Um, I ended up only doing about half my route because I was like, you know what? enough of this. I took a fire road all the way down and I just rode along the train tracks the rest of my way along the valley because I was just so burned out on the hills. So keep in mind that topography is going to be your killer if you're going to be out there, especially if you're carrying a lot of weight and carrying a lot of gear. Cool. Yeah, one thing about uh, Google Maps, using Google Maps for routing, it's really awesome in that it tells you uh, whatever route that you plan, it tells you what the elevation gain is. Um, and checking that um, and planning, using that to plan how many miles you're doing is super important um, for exactly what Galen was saying. Um, but also everyone that I know that's ever used Google Maps for bike camping um, routing will have encountered what I call these like Google Map fails where it routes you on these roads that either don't exist or um, you know, I've ended up on hiking through like I'm a couple miles with my bike on my shoulder, hiking through some like washed out roads that were went through people's property. And um, yeah, definitely. I think the more that you do it, the more you're able to sort of pick out ahead of time what roads those are um, and using the terrain option where you can actually see the road, um, have the like satellite image of what the road is really also helps quite a bit. Yeah, it's also part of the adventure. Um, we were on a road that um, Google told us that would be a really quick right over the top of the mountain, but it ended up dead ending into a forest next to a arterial range. So we decided maybe that's not the best route for us. And so we ended up doing a killer downhill, which meant that we had to do a loop around and then do a killer uphill. Um, some people love hills. Some people only love downhills. 
Uh, it really kind of depends on the person, but it's part of the adventure. So definitely, I think Ada, you had it right. There's definitely a uh, high potential for Google Map fails. Just have an open mind about it. Cool. Um, let's see what else here. So some routing resources for you. Um, this is also achievable on the Mass Bike website. If you want to go to massbike.org under our resources tab, we directly link to the Mass Trails routing system. This is a statewide mapping system which shows, as you can see, the paved routes, the unimproved pathways, which arguably sometimes dead end into to an arterial range. Um, it also shows the bike lanes, the protected bike lanes, the off-road pathways, and the street networks too. This is a really nifty resource. Now it's just localized to Massachusetts, but we're a pretty big state. Um, but this is one tool that you might want to compare with Google Maps. Um, this arguably is better updated than Google as well. Um, because this is dedicated to just trails throughout the state. Um, and I'll show you, this is kind of the greater Boston North Shore area. For those of you familiar with Cambridge, you can see that we have all those blue bike lanes you can see down there in the bottom and all these squiggly dark green lines, which are off-road pathways, which are awesome. You can go almost all the way to Lynn on an off-road pathway from Cambridge and then it's short hops up and you can see that there are um, gaps in the network. But again, maybe a rail trail is not your game. Maybe you want something a little bit more adventurous, a little bit more hilly, a little bit more challenging. So this is just something to compare as one of the many resources for finding routes. Um, also, I'll keep in mind that if you go a little bit further, so this is just a little bit further up in the North Shore, there are not a lot of trails. So you're gonna have to feel comfortable also riding on the roads. Um, I don't wanna get into too much in this presentation, but um, you should feel comfortable in traffic if you're going to do multiple days um, and multiple miles or long distance miles because unfortunately the pathways just don't go everywhere and you're going to have to get out on the streets. You can pick and choose which streets. I don't recommend riding on Route A uh, or 1A. Uh, you would not want to ride for instance on Yankee Division Highway um, which is Route 128. So you're going to want to find creative ways of getting around it but again comparing different maps is going to be the key for making sure that you have success if you're out there and riding. Cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about nutrition. So these are just kind of placeholder fillers to get primed of the conversation. Um, everybody's got different dietary needs and preferences and balances. Um, so let me go grab some examples of what um, the amazing technology in camping food has really gone for in the past couple of years. It's been actually quite amazing. Um, but you're gonna wanna keep in mind that you're gonna be burning well more than 2,000 calories if you're gonna be doing a full day of biking. And for those of you who are road weary and have done bike touring in the past, you're gonna get hungry. You're gonna get very hungry. You're gonna get really, really hungry. You're gonna to wanna to have two lunches. You're gonna have a couple of coffee stops and you're gonna have snacks throughout the day. There is a not so technical term that we call bonking, where if you're riding and around midday, you start to really get fatigue, which means that you're brain starts to shut down, you start to get really grumpy, you don't have a lot of patience. Um, chances are all you need is a little bit of sugar, a little bit of fat, a little bit of salt, and you'll perk right back up and you can get those extra miles going. Um, you're also gonna wanna make sure that you carry as much food as you're gonna need for that day, um, unless you're confident that there's gonna be civilization and stops along the way, and that you've confirmed, especially in the time of COVID, that one, they're gonna be open, and two, that they're gonna be uh, ready to serve you because not everything is open right now. But Aidy, do you have any examples of, oh, thank you. Do you have any examples of some food that you've had when you did your cross country ride? Ooh, I ate a lot of oatmeal with peanut butter in it. Uh, that was my favorite kind of go-to meal when I could, especially in the mornings. Mm -hmm. um, and usually packing something, um, that I could eat really easily, just like pull over to the side of the road and eat really easily during the day. I'm trying to remember what I would eat. Maybe a lot of like sardines and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, peanut butter. Really, you really like crave donuts and all sorts of like baked pastries and, and that, I'll say that. But um, yeah, um, yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think specifically. But. I mean, really, it's like sugars, fats, and salts is going to be what your body craves because you're going to burn those so fast. But then you also have to make sure that you supplement with real nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of examples. These are like camping foods, like pack foods. So like, you know, like some apple crisp that all you got to do is add some boiling water to. 
Um, you don't need to go this route. It's a little bit costly, but it's totally worth it because these are very lightweight. This is basically like dehydrated space food um, where all you got to do is just add some boiling water. So if you have a jet boil or another way to boil water very easily, you can carry multiple days worth of food in your pack at very lightweight. Um, or, you know, live the hobo life and grab some sardines at a store and do it really cheaply too. Um, but just keep in mind that your daily food intake is going to skyrocket. And if you're if unfamiliar with camping trips, it's, um, it's going to be quite a surprise. And especially I've always found there's a little bit of after effect, like the three or four days after I've done a couple days on a bike, I'm still that hungry trying to replenish. Um, and of course, ground coffee is going to be something that is an absolute essential. Um, for me, at least, I was not functional to pack up my tent and get my bike all ready to roll in the morning if I didn't have a uh, hot cup of coffee with me. I think also if you're not a vegan or vegetarian, it's really helpful to have jerky with you um, because I think um, especially if you're doing like a week long ride or a multiple day ride, you know, and you're biking uh, cliff bars or sport bars or something that are really popular, but they're not really that good for providing uh, nutrition. Um, and that's something you really have to adapt when you're on a multi-day ride, making sure that you're actually eating like whole foods and, mm -hmm. um, and not just sports nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, sports nutrition is great if you are doing short-term performance um, kind of exercise, but not for a multi-day ride thing. Mm -hmm. So um, same sort of same kind of stuff that you would bring backpacking um, making sure that you get protein in there is really important. Um, and nuts are great. Um, any sort of like dried foods that you can add water to. You can do overnight oats if you don't want to bring a stove with you. Um, um, stuff that you can either, yeah, just add water to or um, that is light and dehydrated. But also stop it if there's a grocery store and you can stop and like get some fresh fruit and veggies. That's, uh, that's really awesome. But if you're out in the middle of the US, you'll find that there aren't actually that many options for um, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables at some of the grocery stores out there. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, and just the point of the, the sports nutrition is good if you're like need a quick pick me up in the middle of the, the, the ride and you're bonking. Um, it's made to be burned really fast. And so you're gonna be great for 45 minutes, but you're gonna need to keep regenerating. So if you have a goo or a cliff bar or whatever else sports nutrition wise, um, you're gonna need to re-up that pretty frequently. And that just means more stuff to carry, which is fine because you're gonna be consuming it. But um, you know, you can't live off shot blocks and cliff bars and uh, have a successful and happy time because you're going to get super sick of them. You feel really bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I've been amazed. Like these, these camping packs, I mean, they, if uh, the couple of brands like Mountain House, um, Backpackers Pantry, and a few others that are out there, um, you know, typically they say two servings, but I would say two servings per person. <laughs> um, and again, dietary needs. Oh, thanks. I have a whole bunch more of them because we just came back from a camping trip. Um, paleo friendly stuff. This stuff has free range chicken, organic spinach, mushrooms, and, uh, and broccoli. Um, and it, it really does make a difference when you have some texture to the food. Cool. Let's see what else we have in here. Okay, so other resources um, that are out there. So um, know that you're not alone. So we talked a little bit about the East Coast Greenway. Here's a map of the East Coast Greenway, which is fantastic. I'm curious if any of you tuning in have actually done any of the East Coast Greenway routing. Um, this is a prominent feature of Massachusetts. There's a couple of routes that you can take, including the spur that goes along the Cape. Um, but the idea is that the goal is to build a rail trail network that is contiguous throughout the entire East Coast. Essentially, think of it like the Appalachian Trail for biking. A um, couple other resources that aren't on this page, too, are the Rails to Trails Conservancy, and they're working on the Great North American Rail Trail, which will go essentially from Washington State all the way to Washington, D.C. Um, it's about 30% done. The East Coast Greenway is about 37% done. And then another great resource is adventure cycling. Adventure cycling, I'm really going to point you to if you're going to do cross country. 
they've developed a bicycle routing system, a US bicycle routing system. We only have a few routes in Massachusetts, including the US Bicycle Route 1, which goes the Claire Salton stall, which is basically Boston to the Cape, um, and US Bicycling Route 7, which is all the way out in Western Mass. But they have a routing and a mapping um, program, which will essentially take you across the entire country. And adventure cycling has been around um, for multiple decades. A kind of the progeny of it was uh, from the bicentennial in, in uh, 1976. There was a bunch of cross-country bike rides to celebrate America. Um, and so a lot of routes have been developed by riders, which I think is absolutely key. This is not necessarily developed by planners or developed by um, transportation agencies, because we all know that you know, just like the map I was showing earlier of our Massachusetts resources, there are gaps along the way. And bikers really do know how to fill those gaps. And you find the little nooks and crannies, you find the little um, sneaky byways that you normally would not find on Google. But adventure cycling is a fantastic resource for you out there, as is the East Coast Greenway and the Rails and Trails Conservancy. Um, these are all membership driven organizations. So feel free to become a member of these organizations where you'll then be primed with the resources as they get developed. Um, I do wanna throw a caveat out there as we're dealing in a COVID world now, um, not all resources are open and available for you. So you're gonna to wanna to do your homework and do your prep ahead of time to make sure that you're not stranded out there um, thinking that there's gonna be a resource or thinking that there's gonna be a store or shop that's gonna be open for you. Um, and some routes are even kind of changing as you can know in Massachusetts or even in Cambridge in particular, there's talk about um, reformatting the roads and the streetscape for biking in particular, which is not necessarily being updated in real time. So um, this is like a base to get you to go and to think about and to dream and to dream big about some of the resources that are out there. Um, I'll take a pause. Are there anything popping up in the Q&A, AD, that'll direct our conversation? Um, not for the moment. Okay. Um, I, something else that I would recommend is that the adventure cycling maps serve as a really great, like you were saying, base resource. Um, don't feel like you have to stick to them. Um, there is resources like Google Maps, and I don't know if you're, we'll be covering this, but Ride with GPS and mm. Strava, that you can look at other ways that other cyclists have rooted themselves in the past. And also one of my favorite things to do was um, stop in at local bike shops and have like an end destination of where I wanted to go and get their recommendations of what the best route was to get there. Um, I think talking, the more that you talk to people, you can get like the local knowledge on um, what the, you know, secret ways are um, and, the most up-to-date information. And actually, we do have a question. Um, hi, Aidy, hi, Galen. If you had to list your must-haves for bike camping, what would they be? Ooh. Gosh, uh, again, it kind of depends on how far and the weather and the terrain. Um, let's see, from, I'll just use this past weekend as an example. So um, the route that we took was we took the train from Porter Square to Wachusett to the end and just skip that big chunk. And then we rode from Wachusett to the Quabbin Reservoir. Um, then from there we rode to basically the Connecticut River. So we went over the first mountain range there from Wachusett between Wachusett and the Connecticut River Valley and went from Turner's Falls down to Northampton where we were gonna camp each night. And then from there we crossed over the south side and did over a big mountain range there. So. Um, I know that I needed a bike with gears and uh, a bike that was capable of doing mountains for one to make sure you had the gear. Um, there was going to be two of us in relatively temperate climate. So we didn't need uh, sleeping bags, but we did have a pad, um, two inflatable pads. Let me see if I can pull my pads out. Um, you know, something that's pretty beefy. This is like a, an inflatable air mattress. And then we just had a, a top sheet to go on top of it. And that was totally fine. Um, it was going to be very buggy, so we know we needed um, the bug spray. Um, we know that we were going to be out without potable water, so we did find ways of packing um, water with us in multiple containers. Um, see, my camel bags are around. So we had a, um, 
a couple of multiple liter camelbacks that we would fill up, which, you know, adds a lot of weight. So we had to pack lightly knowing that we were going to fill up with water at gas stations along the way um, and have the food that we were going to be self-sufficient with. Um, we know we needed to have fire starters because we were going to have campfires each night. So, um, you know, just make sure you had, these are like some waterproof matches and some fire starters, very lightweight um, or a good lighter, but knowing that we were going to be out and it might be wet, we wanted to make sure that we had enough dry fire starters to start a fire. Um, we had a jet boil, which I don't have handy, so I'm not going to go grab it, but we know we needed to boil water to have with the food. Um, and then because we were going to be out in the woods, um, we had a trowel and some toilet paper, which is also an essential when you're out there. This is a very lightweight plastic trowel, um, just to be good conscientious campers and bury your waist like a kitty cat. Um, those were essential. Um, we also had safety gear. So if you're going to be out in the wild, let's see if I can get it. Um, make sure you have like a first aid kit or something available with you as well. Um, if you're familiar with first aid wilderness, that's great. Otherwise you can bring like a little first aid wilderness book, which is really lightweight, but just in case. But um, especially if you're by yourself, you wanna make sure that you have enough band-aids or bandages if you do get in a crash or do get yourself in a tricky situation. Um, a bivy sack is also a must if you are gonna be out there in the wild, because this could honestly save your life if you are stuck somewhere and you can't get somewhere out there. Um, this is really lightweight. I just throw in the bottom of my pack just, just, just in case. Um, Never actually needed it, but that's a must. Um, so again, it comes down to kind of like, where are you gonna sleep? How are you gonna get there? What are you gonna eat and drink? Um, what's gonna happen if you need some first aid wilderness and then a little bit of comfort level like a fire? And then this was a little bit of luxury, but um, I do have a camping um, uh, chair that I like to bring. Mm. Um, arguably it's very small and very lightweight, but this is not a must must, but for me, it's kind of a must. Um, at the end of a long day, I want to sit somewhere comfortable and take a load off my butt and my legs. Sitting on a log, it doesn't necessarily do it for me. I want to lounge. So a nice little camping chair for me is an essential. And that's just a personal. Um, and then I think, you know, besides that, bike tools. Um, make sure you have a multi-tool. Make sure you have a portable pump. Um, I buried my extra tube, but you all know what a tube looks like. Make sure you have an extra tube or three and a little bit of know-how so that you can change some of the major failures that happen out there. It's really good to know how to fix a chain. If a chain breaks and you need to shorten your chain, you can do that in the wild. I bring a small bottle of chain lube. I bring a rag. Um, you might need to go so far depending on um, like your knowledge of bikes. Like if you were going to go for weeks, on end out there like cross country you might want to bring some extra spokes that fit your wheels in particular you might want to bring a couple of cables just in case a cable snaps if you know how to change that in the wild or a couple of extra brake pads they weigh very little um but you, you kind of have to have a little bit of know how to do that but if you're only going to go for a couple days you probably don't need to go that far um and then um that might be all i really needed and then a headlamp obviously to be able to see at night, like a good quality headlamp. And um, I'll go grab mine, which is right over there too. And then, Aidy, what have I missed? What would you bring? Yeah, I guess my must haves, I, I think you did a good job of covering um, basic must haves of like absolute necessities. I have a couple hacks. I would say I always bring zip ties. Um, zip ties are really helpful to have on hand you know, if your rack breaks, um, if anything breaks, zip ties can be used. A combination of like zip ties and duct tape can get you pretty far. Mm -hmm. um, um, I always bring a knife with me. Headlamp I'd say is really important. Um, especially, you know, you can, you should always have bike lights, but if you end up getting stuck biking in the night, uh, you know, a headlamp can also double as a bike light. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a little bit of duct tape like wrapped around one of the tubes on your bike. Um, you don't have to take a whole roll, just take it and like wrap some around so that you can peel it off and use that. Um, a lighter. My luxury item is a foldable pillow. <laughs> I think everyone has their luxury item. It's the item that you don't really need, but you can't, but you don't want to do it out. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm trying to think. I think 
I think knowing how to change a flat tire, even if you don't know any other bike uh, mechanics is super critical. Um, I think um, going anywhere on your bike, especially in COVID times, um, it's really important to, if you get a flat tire to know how to, how to change it. Um, and with that, um, making sure I have a portable pump um, if I'm doing a multi-day ride, I would make sure that, or anywhere that I don't think that I could get to pump up my tire enough to get to a bike shop to inflate it properly, I would want um, a gauge on that pump. So I use, uh, oh, do I have it right here actually? I've actually been carrying it around with me a lot more lately. No, I don't. Um, I have the Road Morph, Topeak road morph um, and that has a gauge so I'm making sure that I'm inflating my tires to the to the right uh, PSI mm -hmm. um, and also I think a willingness to sort of pro to be able to the problem solve on the go um, I think something especially if you're touring by yourself um, you know willingness to if you're stuck to be able to to flag someone down and ask for help. Um, maybe, you know, there, I think there's been times where I've had friends that have had to like hitchhike part of the way. Um, and, you know, I can recommend that and also not recommend that, but um, having sort of an idea of, um, you know, what are safe strategies if you do have to, if you do have to hitchhike, um, you know, making sure that you text someone so they know who you're with or what the license plate is. Um, I always try, if I ever had to like hitchhike, I'd always try to approach someone rather than have someone stop and offer me a ride. Um, and um, yeah, just sort of little trail hacks like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it really kind of depends a little bit on your distance. Like if you're going to go cross country, you're going to have to be adventurous, um, creative, and take some chances. If you're just going for a couple of days in Massachusetts, um, arguably it's the same gear almost, yeah. but you can get away with you know not having to worry so much because essentially we're around civilization. I think one key to have with you, eighty, uh, that you mentioned there was make sure you get a cell phone and to make sure that you're keeping in contact with people. So if you are gonna do this solo or even gonna be somewhere that is a little bit off the grid, um, have somebody who's at home base who you can check in with. And then I'll, I'll grab one more thing, which is also an essential that I've been using, um, which is a portable battery pack. Oh yeah. Um, these are amazing. Um, they're super lightweight these days and very cheap. Um, this, you know, it's a $40 investment maybe and I can get four or five charges on my phone, which will last me like, honestly, almost an entire week. Um, and then you can charge it up when you actually go back and, you know, have lunch somewhere that's a real establishment, you can plug it in. So making sure that you have a little bit of power with you as well. Um, I'm a little bit of a cheater because my bike has a power generator in the front hub, which means my front wheel is moving. I have lights and I even have a little USB charger on my bike. So while I'm riding, I can charge my electronics, um, knowing that that's not a lot of people set up. So carrying like a small power charger is also a must so that you can basically have power on your cell phone. Um, and a little tip there is if you are gonna go off the grid or even just kind of really out there for a couple of days, make sure your Wi-Fi is turned off so that your phone is not searching for Wi-Fi while you're riding because you will drain your battery like that. Um, or you can even kind of be in airplane mode if you're gonna be with just you know a little bit of power left. And then when you get back to civilization, you can turn your phone back on. But um, you know, little hacks like that will go a long way, but, you know, know how to ration, you know, ration your food, ration your water, ration your energy for what to expect later that day, tomorrow. Um, if you are going to be somewhere without potable water, make sure that you've got enough for the morning so that you've got enough to know when you get to, uh, you know, you, you're going to have maybe 10 or 15 miles before you get to a gas station or somewhere where you can refill. You're going to have to have water in the morning to get you there. So know how to ration, and that also includes rationing your power supply as well when you're out there. Um, yeah. Great question, though. Yeah. I would say uh, the best thing to do is there are some really close campgrounds to Boston, um, one of which is Wampatuck. 
which is also a first come first serve campground. Maybe I shouldn't have given out that secret. <laughs> so, but it's, uh, I think it's only about 20 or 30 miles from Boston. Um, it's also on the commuter rail line. So if you have any issues, um, you can hop on the commuter rail and get back to Boston. Um, another one is Harold Parker. Um, and that is also pretty near a commuter rail line. So if you wanted to try, you know, load up your bike with all of your gear, um, bike out there if you have any issues getting there or if you get there in the camp overnight and are having a bad time and want to go back, you can just hop on the commuter rail and get back pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, trying all this out in low pressure settings like that, um, I think is, is really key. Or I've also, I think one of the first bike camping trips that I ever did, um, I had a friend meet me there in their car. Um, and, um, and I brought all my stuff and tested it out. Um, I think something that's really important is to note is that this doesn't have to be a big cross country or multi multi week experience. It can be just one overnight. Um, yep. and actually all of my bike camping trips this year have been just that it's just a one night overnight. Um, and the more you do it, the easier it will be to kind of get the hang of it and how you pack up your bike and the things that you need and the things that you forgot. You always are gonna forget something. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be, you can go as fancy or as DIY as you want. I've heard people, uh, people that will make panniers out of kitty litter containers um so you can google that it's you know they'll have diy instructions on how to make your own panniers from from that um you know and then you can you can bike camp on almost any bike i'd not recommend a single speed but i've also heard people bike cross country on a single speed mm -hmm. um, so i think the main thing the main thing is making sure that if you're taking weight on your bike is to make sure that your wheels have quite a high number of spokes. So that's usually like 32 spoke, a 32 spoke count or higher on a 700 C wheel. I'm not sure for other, what the spoke count is for other types of wheels. Yeah, I would say that your wheel is going to be particular. So know your spoke type in advance and probably bring an extra spoke or two if you're really going to go for multiple weeks. Um, and just keep an eye on your bike. Do the ABC check all the time, like when you stop for coffee in the morning, et cetera. Um, yeah. oh, I'm going to see. Let's we see. Have a question. Yeah. When finding a place to camp, do you do primitive camping, just set up camp in a, in a field? or find an actual campground? And do you plan camping spots ahead of time or do you just wing it? Ooh, personal preference, I would say. Um, I winged it one day, then we found a strawberry field from a friend a second day, and then we had a legit Department of Conservation and Recreation um, campsite. And on day one, we didn't have any potable water, which was tough, and it was next to a mosquito field. Day two, we had a, uh, a nice, you know, spot that we had guaranteed housing in, but we didn't have potable water, so we needed to bring that. And day three, because it was an actual campground, had a shower, amazing, um, and water, so we didn't have to worry about bringing in water. So it really kind of depends on your own personal preference. If you are going to do guerrilla camping, though, just keep in mind local ordinances, especially around fire, um, and just, you know, if you're going to go long distance. And I've known lots of friends who have done cross country where they've stopped off. Um, churches are pretty keen at letting folks tent on their property. Um, and, you know, typically you just go up to the church and just knock on the door and ask the rector or whomever's there if you can camp there. And typically they're okay with that. Um, they might even have a shower or be able to fill your water bottles for you. But um, it really kind of depends on your own level of comfort. Um, also, if you're um, a male or a female that might change the dynamic of how safe you feel out there um, and you know how able-bodied you are if you want to be a little bit more protective you might not even choose to camp you might even choose to go to a hotel and that's totally fine as well um, and then you're gonna you know maybe build in some rest days where you can re-up and reju re regenerate rejuvenate and kind of build your yourself back up so 
Um, I, I would say I don't necessarily have a hard and fast rule because I've done guerrilla camping. It's been fine, but you can only do that for so long before you really want to get somewhere uh, secure and somewhere where you can re-up. Yeah, I would say with that, um, I always try and pick a couple camp spots. So I'll have sort of a backup op. I'll have an option like at least A and B for the most part, unless I'm really confident that I, unless I know where I'm going and I'm really confident that I can make it and then maybe I've been there before. Um, I usually pick like a shorter ditch option um, and then have like a, yeah, just a couple, a couple campsites or maybe a campsite and like a, a place where I could guerrilla camp if I needed to, if I can't make it to that campsite. Um, having backup options really makes a difference, um, just in terms of your own sanity. Most of the time you won't ever have to use them, um, but knowing that you have that additional plan or that backup plan of like a, you know, an, maybe an earlier stop or, um, um, yeah, an earlier campsite, but. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of mocking up a list here um, of what we were talking about, AD, based off a question from the Q&A about having these written down. So if there's anything that I've missed, um, this is just a tentative list that we can add to. So feel free to chime in here. Uh, I didn't have clothing. I'll add clothing to this as well. But um, we can round up by kind of just populating this list here. Yeah. I would add zip ties. Okay. Um, and one more thing I think I would, um, another resource uh, is this website called Warm Showers. Um, it is um, kind of, if any of you have heard of couch surfing, it's kind of like couch surfing, but for bike touring. Um, and it's basically a community of bike touring people um, that will offer you to either stay in, they'll have anywhere from, you know, they'll meet you for a coffee or a meal to letting you just use their shower, to letting you camp in their yard, to hosting you on their couch. Um, and it's a really, really excellent resource. And um, a lot of times when I would bike pack and um, part of it would take me through a city where there wasn't any good camping, um, I would stay with people through warm showers. Um, it's a really great way, especially if you're trying to keep it low budget. Um, so highly recommend that, probably not for right now in COVID, but also there may be um, warm showers folks that are willing to let you camp in their yard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and this again is not an exhaustive list. Um, you know, we could go more and more and more, but I would say that these are pretty good must haves here. Um, and just do a little bit of prep, kind of know your route ahead of time, know what to expect, um, but then be, ready for adventure when you get out there and take photos and let us know how it goes. Being willing to be flexible is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Well, what else can we add to this list or what else um, might we want to cover? I mean, I, I realize it's a very broad topic, so, yeah. you know, we could, we could dive deeper um, and subsequent check-ins. You could also get in touch with me at, Galen is G-A-L-E-N at massbike.org. You can get in touch with 80. Um, I'm not going to read your whole email, but they've got your email already. Um, check in with a local bike shop, especially in Cambridge. Cambridge Bicycle, when they're open, is probably one of the best in the bike packing world because they've got the gear that's there. They're kind of a bike packing specific shop. Um, but get to know a good bike shop that has some of the resources too. And, and, some, of, and some bike shops will have... Um, little bike camping trips that they'll organize. Um, there's also these Swift campouts that happen um, periodically um, that are great ways to meet people and get started bike packing. Um, Femme Mechanics usually does at least one um, overnight ride. Um, um, and I think there's, um, WTF Explorers and Femme Mechanics and, and, um, and WTF Explorers are both Femme Trans and women identifying folks only, um, but really, really great communities. Um, um, yeah, I think that's just about the hour, but if anyone has any last minute questions, um, you can certainly write them in and we can hang around for a couple more minutes. Yeah, I'm happy to. I think there might be one that popped up, 80, so I'll ask you to check that out. I'll keep this list going too. We can keep adding to this list. 
Oh, wow. Sorry, I didn't see these ones. Okay, for clothing, how many sets of clothing do you bring and how often are you washing them versus re-wearing them dirty? Good question. Um, personal preference. I always like to have one clean pair so that if you're going back to the civilization, you've got that. Um, so I definitely have a clean pair that I keep in a Ziploc that I just won't even really touch until like if I'm going to take a train home or if I'm going to have to go into a store and, and sit down and have a meal or something. Um, in terms of bike gear, um, chamois and um, bike jerseys are really nice because they are moisture wicking and they're lightweight and they're more comfortable when you're riding. So I don't really like to ride in cotton, um, which is also nice because if you don't have a lot of cotton, that cuts down a lot of weight. Um, but to answer the question, I think I usually wash, if I were to say a chamois, I would, um, you know, ride in a chamois in a jersey, wash it that night with some Dr. Bronner's and a stream or something like that, let it dry over the next day, and then I'd wear it the following day. So I try not to do two days in a row. Um, try to do a little bit of sun disinfectant as well. So you can also put your jersey and your gear kind of on top of your pack while you're riding and let the sun come down. Um, which is also something that I forgot to mention I was going to is that you can get solar charging stuff. So this is a solar charging light, which is really nifty. Um, which is an inflatable one. So if you can kind of use the power of the sun, not just for disinfectant, but for power as well, that's kind of a, a little hack as well. But back to the question, um, I'm not really one to wear a set of clothing two days in a row, especially if I'm riding in it. Um, so a little bit of soap, I'll add soap to this as well. Yeah, doc, I, yeah, I do the same thing. I bring, I wear an outfit and I bring an outfit um, and I, I'm pretty good about, uh, you know, whenever you set up camp, it's nice to be somewhere that is near water so you can wash your clothes. Actually, must have is a little nail scrub brush. Um, and I use that for washing my clothes. Um, mm -hmm. That is a really awesome hack. Um, and if I feel like I'm not, I'm gonna be camping somewhere where there's no water, where I'm not gonna be able to wash my clothes, stopping in a bathroom and washing your clothes in a bathroom sink um, Dunkin' Donuts bathrooms are awesome because they're almost only, um, um, like you have the whole, they're single person bathrooms. Um, so you can do like a little sink shower, um, and, you know, take off all your clothes, wash them, put on another set of clothes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then we have one last question. Do you recommend biking clipless? Personal preference, but yes, I do it, especially if there's terrain. Um, and that, that's referring to the shoes that lock into the pedal, um, or it's a special set of shoes and it's a special set of pedals. Um, I do it because you can get better efficiency in the pedal stroke. So if you're gonna do hours and hours out there, you can kind of balance between the left foot and the right foot. Almost subconsciously, your legs can kind of balance each other out if one starts to get a little tired. Um, it's a more efficient way to ride. If you don't ride clipless and you've just got a, a shoe on a pedal, you're just pushing down and down, um, which you know a lot of people that I know have done this as well. If you are not gonna ride clipless, um, I do recommend wearing a stiff shoe, as stiff a shoe as possible. Again, just a personal preference. So I've had friends who have ridden cross country and they do it in hiking boots because hiking boots are very stiff. And the beauty of that is it, it helps with the efficiency of the foot. It kind of makes the foot a more powerful lever. Um, biking shoes are also incredibly stiff. They don't have any flex to them. So it basically translates the power more from the leg to the ankle, to the foot, to the pedal, much more evenly. Um, it's a little bit of a personal preference though. If you're not comfortable riding clipless, um, it's something to get used to. And it's, it's you know, there's pros and cons to it. Um, I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons. It is more costly. There is special gear attached to it, um, but there are ways around it. If you are riding in a sneaker though, um, you're gonna have a lot of flex to the foot and your feet are gonna get sore. Um, just from my own personal experience. So try to find as stiff a shoe as possible. If you are um, biking and camping in uh, hiking shoes, that's also kind of nice that then you also have uh, boots with you so you can go hiking as well um, if you're outdoors. So that it's the added benefit there. If you're just in biking shoes, you know, you get to the end and, um, you know, you take off your shoes and you kind of like walk around in sandals or Crocs or barefoot. Um, biking shoes are really kind of made for biking not really for walking around and hiking. Yeah, and I'll just can, um, clarify that that's stiff-soled. It's the sole that matters, not the, not the upper part. 
yeah. it's having that that power transfer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would recommend if you've never bike clipless and are trying to get into uh, bike camping the first time, maybe don't because the having the extra weight on either on the sides of your bike, if you're using panniers, um, might uh, take a little bit of getting used to. So I would maybe get used to one and then the other, um, not at the same time. Um, so, you know, either start biking clipless without weight on your bike or start biking with weight and then add clipless. But for mountain, for hills and mountains, it makes a big difference. Although I've had friends that have biked cross country with in regular shoes and flat pedals. So mm -hmm. um, one last minute question, joined five minutes ago. So sorry if this was addressed earlier. Is there a way to avoid high speed roads once you get out of the city? My mm -hmm. friend and I wanted to go somewhere a bit further out once, but it seems like there's just highways slash large high speed roads all around the city, at least if you look on Google Maps. Yeah, um, Google Maps, if you do the street view, is actually really nifty. Um, it's hard to, Ada, you mentioned Strava earlier. Maybe I'll stop sharing and I'll go look up a Strava. Um, to show folks, but there's a heat map with Strava. Um, and then actually I will share my screen again to showcase just to answer. And then we did cover this earlier, but that's totally fine. Um, thanks for joining whenever you can. Um, there's a, a good resource called Mass Trails, which is Massachusetts based. And it talks about all the paved trails, the unimproved trails, the protected bike lanes. Let me see if I can make this larger. Um, so if you go to mass.gov slash mass trails, you can also go to mass bike, which is my website. Um, dot org and find the resources tab that'll take you to this site. It's the entire state and it's the um, the streets in terms of the infrastructure that's there, paved, unpaved, bike lanes, protected bike lanes. So this is a good resource and you can see even a little bit outside of Boston, um, there are a fair amount of low stress pathways that are out there. Um, but then I'll also share, I'll stop sharing here and see if I can find Strava real quick. Um, yeah, I think also a big um, a thing is to use a commuter rail uh, to get outside and you can, some of the immediate stuff right directly around Boston is a little bit, uh, you know, tougher to get the nice riding roads. Um, however, um, um, I think one thing to do is when you like search a vicinity, the roads that are more that appear most prominent are those bigger roads, those high speed roads. But if you zoom in, picking the picking some of those smaller roads um, and some of the more like the neighborhood roads and connecting them, um, Google making sure that you're selecting the cycling directions on Google Maps when you do this is is really big. They might actually work better on your phones. I can't confirm that, but sometimes I found that Google Maps on a phone works better for cycling directions than it does on a desktop or computer. Um, and, um, but yeah, making sure that trying to con like find the smaller roads and connect them into paths. So yeah, okay, Strava. Yeah. So this map is based off of people who use Strava, which is arguably a self-selecting demographic. So this is not be all end all. But what this is, is the heat map of uh, people who are biking and you can choose different activities. So you can see here, this is just under strava.com heat map. You can, um, this is just one resource and I can look at the bicycling routes um, and you can overlay it. So you can see where we are in Cambridge and Boston. There's a lot of um, heat a lot of dark colored lines, but say you wanna go up in the North Shore, for instance, um, a lot of bicyclists use uh, this route. So you can kind of take a look and see what this route is. Um, so this is a little bit like a democratization of bike routes based off of people's usage. And you can see there's a lot of good riding that Strava riders do in this general area and a little bit down here, um, obviously coming around the Boston Cambridge area. Um, but for instance, where I was earlier, um, you know, I did essentially a lot of this route, which I would never have figured this could be a cycling route right along, this is the Quabbin Reservoir, for instance. So, you know, a lot of people do these roads, but if you don't feel comfortable and you could do a little Google Street View and say, oh yeah, 45 mile an hour road, that's one lane each direction might not be enough, uh, good for me. 
but there are these roads right along the reservoir. So you can kind of go and, oops, not gonna let me go any closer, but you get the idea of utilizing this resource. And you can see based off the of color that this is a pretty popular route and it's probably because it's very scenic, it's probably because there's um, no traffic on it. This is, and I took this route literally just a couple days ago, so I know it now, but I didn't before. And I was able to kind of use a map like this to see, oh, people bike here. And it doesn't show up on Google. It's not necessarily a prominent um, bike route that's on any other map, but because cyclists have already done it, this is something that I might want to think about checking out. Um, another thing to think about, which I'll throw in here, let's just do a maps.google. And then let's do the Quabbin. Just for example, um, one good thing to think about is the terrain feature that Google has, which I really love. It might take a second, but you can kind of get an idea of what you're in for based off the topographical map. So say you're going to bike from the Quabbin and you're going to want to end up in the Connecticut River Valley. You might think about, you know, crossing a couple of mountain ranges here, but then it gets pretty flat this whole route. And so you can utilize maps, not just to find less traffic, but you can also find the flattest routes. Um, and along with that, if you pair this with Strava and pair that with the Massachusetts map off of massbike.org um, or the Mass Trails map, um, and then you know finding local groups. For instance, there's, um, and I'll just use this example here. This is Franklin County. Franklin County has a bicycling route system. So if you call up a bike shop or talk to a bike shop, this is one of 80's recommendations is checking with the bike shops they'll have the best routes. Um, so say if I was gonna say, um, look here, I might just go for a Google and say, what's the Franklin County, Massachusetts bike route? Um, you'll get you know, some suggestions of you know, bikeways, Western Mass, for instance. So you can kind of get creative and I would mainly recommend that you find three or four different resources that you compare to. So, um, this is maybe not the most efficient way of me for finding stuff for you, but this is just an example of places of, of, of spots that you can look um, to compare your routes. So traffic is an issue, terrain is gonna be an issue, and where other bicyclists have been, it's gonna be another issue for you to kind of compare and contrast. I hope that answered the question. It's a, it's a very broad question. Um, and then one more thing to mention too is, see if I can go back to, because you joined a little bit late, um, I'm just going to rehash this um, of the East Coast Greenway as an example. Um, so if you go to eastcoastgreenway.org, you can find some off-road, uh, some trails and rail trail pathways, which is a network system that we're building throughout the country, I mean the East Coast. And then Adventure Cycling has maps that crisscross the East Coast. They have a U.S. bicycling route system. Um, but, you know, a road is only as good as how it feels to the rider. So don't necessarily think that these are, um, you know, written in stone. So you will need to get creative and compare a bunch of different resources together to kind of make your own decisions. Awesome. Well, I think that's just about as much time that we have. So thank you for every, uh, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, feel free to reach out to either Galen or myself. Um, and yeah, happy bike camping. Yeah, go explore, have fun. Yeah, um, so I hope you give it a try. If you do give it a try after this um, webinar, we would love to hear about it. So, mm -hmm. um, awesome, thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks for everybody for joining. Um, please keep in touch. Um, AD's got a lot of different webinars too. So from the CDD department, I'm just gonna make a pitch for you. You're doing yeah. some great work at the city of Cambridge. So <laughs> um, keep an eye out for more opportunities to plug in AD's work and then Please keep in touch with Mass Bike. Um, we are statewide, but of course, all biking is local. So we're interested to find out how your biking is going. Um, if there's any advocacy that you want to plug into or you need some support with. And then, of course, we just love to talk bikes. So um, I love to see photos. I love to hear stories. And 
my tips might not be the same as what you would bring to, and this is always an evolving conversation. So don't think that we are the ultimate resources. We're just, um, you know, one point of reference for you and, you know, go have fun. You can do it. At the end of the day, it's whatever works for you. Love it. <laughs> All right. Bye everyone. And thank you, Galen. Yeah, thank you, Adi. Bye. Bye.